Or maybe just in the front. Sorry, I'm fussy. I'm French. This is what I do. Well, never mind. Cool. All right. So thank you so much uh, for these great presentations. We um, so we you, you guys covered a lot of ground, and you're all very thirsty, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> um, and uh, so j just wanted to start. Maybe I think it'd be it'd be very interesting for the audience to actually uh, hear a little bit more about about you guys, about your personal background. So you're you know part of a uh, a rare group of people that's very much in demand, you know, data scientists. So as we all know, the, the term sort of didn't exist a few years ago. It appeared, and now it's one of the most uh, sought-after jobs. So I think it'd be interesting uh, for people to understand sort of what's your personal journey towards becoming a data scientist. And, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a sub-question to this, I'd be interested in hearing more about what it is that you learned in school that was helpful and what you learned on the job and basically how, how you got trained to do what you do now. And whoever wants to start first, maybe Kathy. Sure. Can people hear me? No. Um, so I, I was trained as a mathematician. I got a PhD in number theory. Um, then I worked in finance. People in here? Okay. Um, I worked at GE Shaw as hedge fund um, during credit crisis and then risk metrics, um, which is a risk uh, third party risk assessment firm, software firm. Um, for another couple of years, I quit in 2011 and I rebranded myself a data scientist and worked in internet advertising for a year and a half. Um, and then I, I've recently joined VRL and um, I've been blogging for a couple of years. I just wanted to mention, like, and maybe I'm going to go head to head with Drew about social science versus math people here, because um, I like to be provocative. Um, one thing I learned as a mathematician is, and I think this is one thing that is really important in data science, is how to be wrong. Um, math mathematics is like one of those fields where you can be wrong, <laughs> and it's not shameful. Um, you can say, oh, I can prove this. And someone will say, okay, let's see the proof. And you start, and you're like, oh, shit, it just doesn't work. And they're like, yeah, it doesn't work. You're wrong. And you're like, okay, I'm wrong. It's not embarrassing. It just means I have to go back and do it again. And I, I really think in other fields, it, 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 you spend more time arguing that you're right, even if you're wrong. And I think that it, it, it sort of lends itself towards becoming a skeptic a little bit. And if I just may say one more thing. Um, a social scientist, um, and not to be negative about, I mean, I like, I like the idea of interviewing lots of different people for data science jobs, and there's no reason that a social scientist wouldn't be a perfect fit, but a social scientist needs to know the math from top to bottom. A mathematician needs to know the human aspect from top to bottom. So the question isn't, is one of them a perfect fit? The question is, um, can that person learn what they need to know, and do they admit that they need to know it? And I, I feel like not every mathematician admits that they need to know it. I certainly worked in finance with a bunch of people that thought mathematics was going to be enough to understand finance. And then when the credit crisis came around, they were shown to be wrong, quite wrong. Um, but on the other hand, there are plenty of mathematicians who can do that, can make that leap. So I'll stop there. Should I jump in there? Want to respond or whatever? Like, uh, no particular well, order. So my response to that would be um, that's absolutely right, but mathematicians don't hold the uh, sway over being wrong. I mean, every discipline, <laughs> uh, what, any any person who's who's well trained in their discipline, a function of being well trained is being skeptical about their own work first before anything else. Um, and to respond to the training aspect, I mean, I totally agree. You know, most social science, well. Actually, few social scientists now are not getting any mathematical training or statistical training. Um, there are, at least to my knowledge, very, very few mathematicians who are getting any social science training. Um, but my sort of challenge to, particularly mathematicians, I think, is the nature of the field is, um, I guess, very autonomous, very singular. It's a, it's a singular adventure for a long time, and then you, know, you sort of present your work. Uh, I think it's much harder to learn and be trained on the human aspect than it is to be trained on the, the math and the computer science. Yeah, but we're supposed to be introducing yourself, so I'll, I'll hold on. Thank you. Let's go ahead. Well, you got another two minutes. Oh, OK. Um, I, I just want to, it's fine. Um, mathematicians, in fact, 
collaborate all the time. It's a, it's a mistake, and a common mistake, to think that math, I mean, mathematics is actually a social situation. As a community, mathematics is decide what's interesting, what's important, whether something's true. If you guys have heard about the ABC conjecture recently of a Japanese mathematician, Mochizuki claimed to prove the ABC conjecture, but no one has been able to validate it because he made the mistake of going into his own little universe of one inhabitant and living there for years and years and writing this stuff up. No one can understand it. It's not, it's not a proof. That makes it not a proof. A proof is a social construct. construct. So anyway, I just want to dispel the myth that mathematicians work alone. They do not work alone. They work in groups. And I, I do agree that we don't have a lot of social science training. But I'm just saying, the, the, the self-selected mathematicians who come out to the world of data science and say, I want to work in business, are the people that are like, I'm interested in interacting with people. And there's plenty of mathematicians that I would say, do not hire that person as a data scientist. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying the people who have been trained in thinking through things, and more importantly, never being intimidated by the technical aspect of it. Never being intimidated. I think a lot of bad data science happens because people are like, I don't really know how this algorithm works. I'm hoping when I press this button, something good comes out. And look, it converged, so it must be OK. That's not cool. Like, you need to be able to say, I understand it from top to bottom. I, I, could, I can tweak this par parameter, and I know exactly what happens. And that's a confidence that I think mathematicians do come to the table with. So we'll, we'll move on to, I guess, Chris or whoever wants to. But just, just to, um, I think, you, you, uh, Kathy, you were right on in uh, just mentioning in, in your last point. So part of the reason why I'm asking the question is that, um, you know, we have, I, I know that we have a bunch of entrepreneurs in the audience. And uh, I think everybody's sort of wondering, you know, okay, I need a data scientist, but what does that person look like? So in addition to your sort of introduction, I'm essentially uh, interested in helping everybody understand, okay, well, this is what the data scientist might look like. And I think we've established that it comes in different flavor, but um, that's why I'm asking the question. So, um, not to, to skip too much, it's, sorry, do you mind? What? Who, me? You're yeah. gonna go next, but I wanna take your spot. Okay, he, master, bo master boss, so. Uh, whoever wants to speak, like just okay. so you guys. Yeah. So, uh, my background originally is also in mathematics. Uh, as a, a bachelor's degree, didn't go on to do any advanced degrees at this point. Um, and uh, I definitely agree that there is a, um, a lot that doing pure math can teach you about seeing something you don't understand and then knowing that all it's going to take is time of banging your head against it until you understand it. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I feel like, so I, I left college a little bit early to go work on projects. And I feel like the thing that I, don't see, I, I've also, I've worked with a handful of, of startups and, and larger companies here in New York and, and elsewhere to try to hire people to do data science work. And um, I think that uh, I'm not really sure that uh, somebody with an advanced degree and no experience is actually any better than somebody who um, has got, has spent some time actually working in, 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 out in the field. Um, I feel like the people who I've seen hired in as PhDs often have a sense of entitlement about their, how much they're going to have to be able to work on their own problems at the exclusion of the needs of the company. Um, I think there is a lot more to be gained, especially in data science, from having done projects than having necessarily spent two or three years going in depth on one topic. Um, you, we very, very rarely have that luxury in practice of spending so much time on something. And I think um, what I've seen, the most successful hires of people that I've helped having people who came to the table with a portfolio of lots of things they had done. Um, and whether they get that from doing a PhD but also working on other projects, or they get that from having a healthy interest in the topic, I think it's really more about wide exposure and about uh, an understanding of how to ship than it is necessarily about a, a, you know, five or six years spent doing the same thing and getting a piece of paper for it. So just quickly, I mean, so working on this project, you, you sort of train yourself, or you were you like apprenticed into it, or? So yeah, so for, for my background, um, if these, I think these mics are cutting in and out, and so I apologize if it's hard to hear me. Um, for my background, originally it was pure math. Uh, I got very interested in data visualization, actually, originally. Uh, I read some Tufty books and a couple other things, and some Tukey, actually, and got really into this, the, the idea of, uh, um, of visualizing data, um, and then started working with some faculty at uh, the university that I was at, and working with some other people doing work in journalism in Chicago. Um, and I spent, I don't know, 
three or four months after I finished college, uh, I left early and then spent three or four months just finding people with interesting problems and, and trying to, to offer what I could. And um, uh, I did some work on comparing the um, effect of uh, uh, public transit cuts in Chicago, sort of looking at the, the spread of access in different neighborhoods before and after, and trying to relate it to uh, race and class and other things like that. Um, and that got picked up by the New York Times. And so I got to write an article with them, which was a, a really great opportunity. Um, and just basically collaborated with lots of people who had problems, who needed somebody to do the work for it, um, and built up a portfolio that way of things that I had done that I could demonstrate that I had actually accomplished. Um, and then when uh, about, I don't know, five, six months in, into doing this and, and kind of making a, a living at it, I got, uh, like four of my friends sent me this uh, job description for the OkCupid um, sort of assistant to work with the blog. And so I went f basically, you know, about a half a year out of being out of college to going at OkCupid where um, I was for a, a little over two years doing work with uh, uh, the fellow who's the author of the blog. Basically, he would have things he was interested in and we would brainstorm about how we would actually attack these problems. and. Uh, if, I don't know if any of you are not familiar with the OkCupid blog, but OkCupid's an online dating site, and there was a popular blog for a while looking at, at uh, you know, what your phone, how your phone related to the number of sex partners you had said you had. Um, uh, it, we, we, there were, we did a lot of, of really interesting things around um, uh, kind of the implicit data that people dropped by going through a dating website, not only the questions they answered, but also the questions they chose to mark hidden, the kinds of uh, people they looked at. Um, one of my favorite results actually was, um, uh, so there are some questions that people mark as hidden that are actually very well predicted by questions they don't mark as hidden. And of course, nobody realizes this, but so we went, went through and, and um, uh, did a little bit of, of uh, probability to try to figure out, um, in, in some sense, the correlation between these, these categorical questions. Um, and we found one of the most interesting ones was that people who said they liked the taste of beer were twice as likely to be open to uh, having sex on a first date. And so, so I mean, this is one of those things where um, is, is this a, a fact I would want to like, spend a ton of money as a result on? Would I like, allocate national resources, like funding resources, based on that kind of analysis? Probably not. Um, I don't even know how you do that. But, uh, um, but you know, the, the, that's you know, basically spent a lot of time working on that and doing a lot of intelligence stuff for them internally and working on projects. And then now for the last two years, I've been running a data strategy consulting firm. Um, I actually don't call myself a data scientist anymore. I call myself a data strategist. And um, basically work with people who either are um, trying to build up new products or trying to uh, work on hard problems within their organizations, figure out how to do it better. And that's what I do at this point. Cool. Thank you. Chris, we skipped you. OK. Um... So my background, I, I am a, I'm an applied mathematician with a PhD in theoretical physics who applies machine learning and biology. That means I love all creatures, great and small. Uh, so instead of pushing back on either of you, I'll push back on you later. Um, my, my training was in theoretical, I got a PhD in theoretical physics at Princeton, which is a pretty theoretical place, uh, particularly it was in the 90s. Uh, my training in theory, my, so my scientific, my PhD was in a field uh, where statistics was not heavily represented. In fact, in physics, uh, my training was pretty much represented by Lord Rutherford's quote about statistics. You probably know Lord Rutherford has two famous quotes about science. The first one is, um, in science, in science, there is only physics, and the rest is stamp collecting. That's, that's, that's Lord Rutherford's most famous quote about science. His second most famous quote is, if your experiment needs a statistician, you ought to have done a better experiment. So I would, I would say that my, my physics training was, was consistent with that sort of worldview of the, of the feeling of statistics. And then I was interested in biological modeling, and I got my PhD at a time when the relationship between biology and numbers was changing dramatically and painfully in 1998. Uh, um, in the mid-'90s, I was writing papers about biological modeling, and sort of no real biologist really cared. And then around 1998, people started sequencing whole critters and, and making microarrays, and real-life biologists started publishing papers saying, we desperately need the help 
of theoretical physicists and astronomers and computer scientists and anybody who knows how to look at data because we don't. And uh, so there was, you know, there were a lot of data in biology all of a sudden. And I started seeing papers published by physicists like who, like wildebeest, would go into the field of biology, sort of, you know, not really paying a lot of attention to domain expertise, and uh, and also, frankly, not really doing things that were just statistically bad, just <laughs> really, really bad things. And uh, and I, so I started trying to figure out the wheat from the chaff in computational biology, and that is how I had to learn about machine learning. Like I had to learn about high dimensional data, and I learned it on the street, and it was very painful. Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't taken a statistics class ever. I haven't taken a biology class since ninth grade. So that sort of self-education about biology and computational biology and statistics was extremely illuminating. And the only way I was able to do it was to make friends with people from other fields, to take them to a bar, buy them beer, and just steal all of their intelligence. And that's, that's really... <laughs> well, Princeton was not that kind of... Uh, <laughs> That kind of bar scene. Anyways, uh, thank you, though, Kathy, for that <laughs> extremely, <laughs> extremely distracting vision. Um, anywho, so I, I once I started using tools from highfalutin and high dimensional statistics in my research in in, in biology, uh, I became very interested in the gap between machine learning as it's understood for, say, character recognition or or, or something like that, some hard engineering win and the way that statistics is understood in the natural sciences. So I would say for 11 years now, I've been extremely interested in that gap between uh, machine learning and the natural sciences. And, and many of the ideas that were useful to me in, in closing that gap are, are now under the name of data science, um, including the idea of working closely with domain experts, using the right tool for the right job, not being too particularly attached to any particular model, and most importantly, knowing how to communicate those results to a domain expert because, you know, I'm publishing, or I'm attempting to publish in the biological literature, which means working closely with real life biologists and trying to answer questions that are of interest to the biologists, not answer questions like, can I get 0.03% test loss rather than 0.04% test loss? You know, that's not a natural science question. Uh, and so that's been a very interesting um, education for me. I, I do think that theoretical physics turned out to be a pretty good training, I, and, I, and I, I only started to believe that after I started to collaborate with people from different disciplines. I can remember, um, so I spent uh, several years, Joa Freund, who was a co-inventor of Adaboost, was at Columbia for a while, and I remember talking to him about theoretical physicists. His cousin is a theoretical physicist turned machine learner, and he said, theoretical physicists just don't get stuck, and that's sort of the wildebeest aspect is, you know, they, they won't get particularly attached to any one model, and if things are not working, they'll say, screw it, and they'll work on a different technique, and they'll do just whatever it takes to make it work. And sometimes whatever it takes involves doing something illegal, which is why you see sort of bad statistics in uh, computational biology or, uh, I don't know, e econophysics, right, another place where physicists have run wild like wildebeest. Um, but also the other thing that's useful about a training in theoretical physics is, as another computer scientist said to me, all the problems that you study in physics are solved problems. And what he meant by that is the, the four pillars of theoretical physics training basically is stuff that was canonized in 1926, right? So you learn like electricity, magnetism, statistical mechanics, classical mechanics, and quantum mechanics, the last of which was pretty well hammered out in 1926. And so you know what a closed problem looks like, and you sort of know what the end will look like. And that helps you when you want to do things like Max was talking about, like just conjecture, like before I even sit down and write the R script or W get to get my data, what the hell graph am I going to draw? And what will mission accomplice look like? If my graph looks like this, will I be happy or sad? And sort of knowing what, a, knowing what a, a closed problem looks like, I think was a very useful training. So since I love all creatures great and small and I wouldn't want to push back on any of my co-panelists, I'll still push back on Matt, which, which one thing is, you know, the history of data science is kind of interesting. Like, I, I, know, I recognize that like, if you look at the Indeed chart for data science, hockey sticks in 2008, but you know, the, the ideas of data science, I would say, were certainly there in 1962, and, and actually you can find papers by Hotelling and Deming from 1940 saying, maybe we should look at scatter plots. You know, even <laughs> in the mathematical statistics literature, there are people who really tried to emphasize the primacy of the data. And even the term data science uh, was used quite explicitly by Bill Cleveland, who's the editor of John Tukey's uh, lectures, in a paper in 2001 saying a proposal for a new field, 
data science. I urge you to go look at this paper from 2001 in which the principles of a field of data science are very much like we now know them today. And in fact, that paper was certainly, a, it was a paper about what a curriculum should look like for the young people. And that paper was certainly on my mind with my colleagues when we thought about what an educational um, program should look like. I think that's probably all I had to say about my training. Thanks. Claudia, and I think, uh, so after you, I'll, uh, since it's already uh, 7.30, I'll just uh, start opening up uh, for questions. So you guys should think about what you want to ask, uh, Claudia. Okay, my, so my background, uh, I'm not a mathematician, and a lot of people try to speed up. Um, I started out as a computer scientist. Um, I think I had one sad start in my life, so uh, I learned most of my statistical uh, knowledge also by accumulation and working with the right people. So back to that, um, I somehow stumbled into a course on artificial neural networks. Kind of sounded cool. It was taught by a German guy, um, back in Boulder, and that got me hooked on data and, and modeling. So um, I took it from there. My attitude to life was to avoid having to work for as long as possible. So I managed to hang out in universities for 13 years um, without appearing maybe. Um, so. Talking about uh, experiences, I, I worked in my first kind of graduate project. Um, we collected like 40 different data sets and just tried to you know, clean them up. That was a very valuable experience, much more so than the research of what happened afterwards. Yeah. Uh, for my dissertation, <laughs> I collected another 20. Uh, they were no cleaner than the first 40. Um, <laughs> so I gained a lot of experience with that. And um, I then, um, after my PhD, this actually comes from a business school, so I'm not sure where that put me, I was supposed to have a kind of a background in psychology, so I had to take organizational behavior to make up for my PhD requirement on psychology. Uh, it was painful. Um, so I had a little bit of social science, but we did some human behavior as well. So then I went to IBM to the uh, research lab out of Boston, that's George Watson, and there the name of the game was you had some time for yourself, some time I spent personally on winning data mining competitions because I liked the challenges. Um, but uh, I think the core was um, consulting gigs that came in from the consulting arm where they had a customer who had a problem and they needed a halfway decent answer in about three months on a really fuzzy data set that was completely useless for the problem they're trying to solve. Right. Um, so I learned a lot about this. So some of I was trying to figure out with the really more genius how, how can you make do with what you have been dialed in and see how far you can push that. Um, and so. Um, then, yeah, I went off to join um, digital um, advertising. And what I love about that, that job is um, it's a playground. It will love me play on. I can, I can try it all. I mean, big deal if I make a mistake. I show you the wrong ad, well, you know, um, I, I, can, I can really, it's like the golden age of experimentation. I can actually try to see what kind of data goes with what kind of algorithm, what questions can you ask more. What can't? What can you actually measure? What doesn't? When are you measuring the wrong things? Can you get the causality or not? Um, so I just love playing around right now, and I enjoy it a lot. And I go out and teach whatever I learn in the process uh, to my MBA students at MIT. Great, <clears throat> great. Thank you. Okay, so as I said, I'd like to start taking questions if anyone has. But you, um, Everybody was welcome, but I'm particularly interested in anybody who actually is uh, a data scientist, so like your own, our own, a uh, bunch of you guys. What's that? You can hear us? Just, your mic. Just you. Just my mic, okay. I will not take it personally. Can you please start with your just name and company, please? Right. Anil Tarachandani, US in Life. Um, so one of the things that's been mentioned around is uh, always start the question when you're querying the data. Um, but if you query, if you ask a really specific question, then you'll never find the unusual relationships. So where is the balance between a, a very defined question versus a very loose question? So I don't think it's necessarily that you start with a question. I think you should start with a need. You should first figure out what is the problem I'm actually trying to solve before I do anything else. Um, then I, I completely agree that if you uh, narrow your question too much at the beginning, you are going to wind up in a situation where you're, you're answering too particular of a, of a thing. I think, I think there, there are a lot of situations where you're not, 
where well, you're right, where, where the need is so broad, and it's not so much, you know, um, tell us which one of these things to, to create. It's more like, in, in Claudia's case, you know, predict this thing, and we don't even know how to do it yet. And I think in those situations where it is very broad, um, you have to do, you know, as Chris said, try to think of what a solved solve solution will, would look like. Think of several solutions. How would I tell the difference between them? And then that'll help you try to narrow, narrow down what are some particular questions I can ask, but don't stop there. Is that helpful? Do you want to? Thank you very much. Uh, yep. A.B. Mendez, I'm with uh, Knight Capital. A question for Claudia. Um, you talk about um, how it's very difficult for you know, companies like, like your company, uh, data scientists like yourself, to, to demonstrate, you know, separate the botnets from the real human beings. And, and you it sounds like you've done a lot of complex work uh, to sort of um, shed light on that problem. What are, if, is the, if there's a way that you can summarize this, uh, you know, what are the ways that um, ad tech companies have um, have provided data, have described the real value that they're delivering to their customers? Because I think at the end of the day, your customer knows how many new customers they're actually getting. So they're not, not going to like, you know, pay twice as much as they logically should for that. So they, they have some way of measuring results. How do you describe the results to them? I, I think uh, reporting is a big part of, of what you guys do. And have there been any breakthroughs in that area in the last couple of years? I mean, honestly, the whole question of net tracing as they say, is a huge mess. And uh, if you're lucky, you can actually find new customers. But get how many uh, infinity or four other nines? A lot better, right? Yeah. So that brings you to the problem that you actually have no clue what you're doing. So you can go, <laughs> no, realistically speaking. And uh, I think this is where part of the problem comes from. That the net trace, the thing you really want to measure, just doesn't exist. And you can try and deny that with offline sales and good luck doing that because it doesn't cost you nothing really either. Um, to the question of fraud, I think because the metrics are so bad, that's really an off trade policy. I mean, there are so many people who are much better off looking the wrong way when it comes to fraud. Um, everybody sort of just basically hinges on getting that one wrong metric to look at the top. So if you have that, if the leaders in the game, they all try to optimize something else. If you work not directly with the customer, but say with an agency, and you tell them, well, yeah, I think if you increase the way up by a factor of three, the trust me, you're not more for me. So guess what? Half of them are in China. Um, I mean, yes, I think if you're higher, thanks for it, but really, is that really what you want? And they don't really feel comfortable going back to their client saying, yeah, by the way, the thanks for it, we've been dealing with the last four years. Well, we're not sure about that. So it's, it's just very entrenched right now, and uh, having that dialogue just will support that in the fall of maybe even 2011, we had instances. We haven't even talked about this. And finally, what? Half a year later, we get to see a uh, little uh, news story throughout the ad tech magazine that that's what they thought. Like, the, nobody really wants to hear that. And I, yeah, that's my short answer. Um, I'm personally very disappointed with the way it's happened. Thanks. One, one here. So you. Name and company, please. Uh, I'm Doris with EDF. I uh, have a question for all. Uh, what are the industries you particularly like to apply your theories and techniques to, and why? And actually, I would, I would add to this. Actually, there's always a question that I'm um, curious about, which is how important is deep vertical knowledge in what you guys do of an industry as opposed to sort of horizontal technical capabilities? I, I your favorite, what? favorite industries. Favorite industries? To apply your techniques in. Whoever will oh, hire us next. <laughs> I, um, probably something that actually improves the world. Like, it's really hard to get paid to do that. Um, so. Well, so I, I actually, I, I, I can answer this a little bit. Um, one of the things that I do is I spend probably 60% of my time doing things that pay me and another 40% working with NGOs. Um, and I find that uh, working with nonprofits and NGOs is actually a great place to apply these kinds of skills because there's so much low-hanging fruit. There's so many simple things that they aren't doing. Like um, a lot of a lot of companies are already, even if they're not machine learning savvy, are already fairly metric savvy and 
um, you know, they know how to collect data somewhat, and they have some reporting capabilities, and you know, maybe a, a model is going to help them improve things by a, a percent or two, which is real bottom line value, no doubt. But if you are trying to uh, um, reconnect people who are scattered because they're refugees, as I said, fellow Aaron and I over here are working on this project of um, helping people who are um, refugees in refugee camps reconnect with their families. And the, the data um, that they collect is very valuable, but they really just don't even have the time or any of the energy to really analyze it. And there's so much you can do with, with so little. I find that's, in, in my mind, one of the, the, the best places to apply these, these techniques. Yeah, and the project that Max was talking about comes out of an organization that um, I and a friend of mine, Jake Porway, started called Datakind. We sort of recognized that there was this gap between people sitting on this stage and people in, in the social sector who we knew had a ton of data as a function of their mission and their mandate, or whatever it was, but we wanted to work on those interesting problems and didn't know how to actually get to them because we didn't know any of those people. We knew all these kinds of people who were working in technical jobs. So we decided to start an organization that did that, and we've been working for almost two years now to build it out, and we've been very lucky to have Max and Kathy and others come and join the, the organization. But me personally, I mean, I love working in things that I feel have a real impact. I mean, I spend time uh, working on data kind projects. I go hang out at the mayor's office and see how the city data is working, go hang out and try to teach a class. I mean, those are things that I think are most satisfying. And then I also enjoy working with entrepreneurs. I mean, my sort of day job is working in a VC fund where I don't do any investing work. I work only with the companies once they're in the fund and try to help them just do a lot of what has been described on the stage. Think about, you know, what is it that you're really trying to solve? What are the relevant data? How does that eventually lead toward a product? You know, those are the things that I think are really interesting um, for data scientists because part of it, at least for me, is, you know, it's, it's a very kind of cerebral and iterative process. And there's this little tiny window in which you're actually like chugging data, creating a model, and then doing the output. And that seems like a much smaller part of what I actually do. Yeah, I really enjoyed working with Medical Data Data Scientist on this. Um, I'm sometimes wondering when it comes to pharma, what the incentive structure is and whether, you know, okay, enough said. Um, but um, what's a little bit frustrating about it is data scientists, because it's an industry that has been collecting data for a long time, it has a lot of legacy issues about how they collect data. And the nice thing about other fields that start up, they get it right because it's a tabula rasa where you start collecting data just from scratch and you have a good chance that this looks good. Uh, medicine it was always like an uphill battle. You needed a domain expert to even figure out what the hell that stuff meant and uh, all these kind of quirks and how it was collected. So that's kind of a tedious part where you may not need the knowledge yourself, but you need somebody to talk to to have the style of to really get to the bottom of the data base. Last, last point speaks to your question, which is the importance of domain expertise. In biology, I found it u totally useful to have some domain expert that you collaborate with you, at some point, you have to frame and represent a problem in some way. And usually the domain expert or a biologist, in, the, in my case, is, is expert at figuring, at helping you figure out how am I going to reframe, you know, 50 years of bench work in terms of the feature space, say, or the, you know, the unknown parameters in the model. You predispose yourself to success and you're able to produce a model that's interpretable. And because I'm an applied mathematician and I like to collaborate with people, it's just more fun to you know, work closely with the domain expertise. It's, it's, it's an intellectual challenge to figure out how are you going to take a natural science question and reframe it as a, for example, machine learning task. Do you need to work with a subject matter expert? You don't need to be one. Right. I, can, uh, I, can give a, I, mean, I, I can give a very specific example. I didn't actually get to talk about my past. It's not very interesting. But one of the things, the first thing that I did, I, I worked in the intelligence community for five years. I was a computational social scientist, which I think is what they called data science back in the mid-2000s. Um, and the last job I had before I went to graduate school was actually working um, for an organization called the Joint IED Defeat Organization. So we were creating models that we would actually use to predict the placement of IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we would send down range, you know, predictions wrapped up as tactical moves to soldiers to say, here's where we think you should avoid today, here's where you think you should avoid tomorrow. And the subject matter expert there was the soldier on patrol. So like this is a very sort of tactile example of subject matter expertise mattering, because when you say to a soldier, I don't think you should go down that corner, and they say to you, that corner has been blown up for two weeks, it doesn't exist anymore. You know, that's when you really get to understand the reason why having really sort of in the loop data 
and subject matter experts uh, is really impactful. So it's like you know, sort of everything else that you do, that everything else that I've done that since then sort of informed by that process of saying, well, I, I need to know what I don't know every single day, right? because every single day things are changing. We have your thoughts, and just to be, you know, make it 100% clear, the reason why I'm asking is always the same thing. There's a bunch of, of people here who are looking to hire data scientists. So, you know, do do if I'm a, a startup CEO and I'm looking for my data scientist, um, I, you know, do do I focus on somebody who really understands, you know, ads or finance or health, um, or do I find somebody who is, a, you know, very sort of horizontal? But I mean, uh, think about hiring Tukey or Leo Bryman or some of the anointed great applied statistical scientists who worked as consultants. Their skill wasn't because they had great expertise and you know, educational testing service in the case of John Tukey, just because they were great listeners and they had respect for the people they were collaborating with. So I wouldn't say that you need to go hire, I mean, if you look at Renaissance Technologies, right, they didn't win because they hired a bunch of MBAs, right, they hired a bunch of people who, you know, clearly were good at, at understanding how to represent that problem in terms of a quantitative field. So I think what you're looking for is not a particularly somebody with a domain background, but somebody who's proven themselves to be a good listener. Kathy, I just wanted to go back to the question. Um, so I've been working with Data Kind for the last six months on a project about money and politics. I don't get paid for that, but I, I'm, I'm very happy to be doing it. Um, I also started MathAid essentially after leaving finance because I, I find like a bunch of rights away about being able to talk about what is actually done in the hedge fund, but I didn't sign away my rights to talk about the techniques. And I was like, these techniques are powerful. We can use these. This is before I realized that there was such a thing as data scientists. Um, I said, this, we need to open up this field. It's like a skill or like a, you know. So the domain expertise, I'm working with the Sunlight Foundation. So this guy, Lee Drutman, at the Sunlight Foundation. I could not be doing this project without him, right? Because he explained how Congress works. He explains to me what a speech, what speechifying really affects and influences, how people actually um, don't get their votes influenced, people vote along party lines. It's really a question of what gets sponsored, what gets co-sponsored. You know, I had no idea about those things. So domain, domain expertise, yes, absolutely, you're crucial. Being a good listener is the most important thing. And being a problem solver and saying, is this logical? But I just wanted to just sort of say one other thing, going back to can you get paid for doing that kind of thing? I think, this is, I think of data science as, and the general modelization of everything in sight, including education, including getting a job, uh, insurance, health, it's a war and we're losing. Like we are, this is a war of the people who have money and can go hire data scientists to, to, to make predatory models against the people who are the, the prey. That's why I have that predator prey thing. The people in this room are actually winning because they're the ones that have the job to do that stuff. But in general, so if you're asking me what I want to work on, I want to work on making the prey those very companies that do that, right? So one of the things I love the idea of is jamming the signal for ad tech. I worked in ad tech, by the way, but I would love to see a really good company that just jams the signal, just either gives me false signals or like you can buy a persona or you can just get just so much cookies that, you, that nobody knows how to interpret them and they send you or they just, you always get the best offer, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> That's the kind of thing that turns me on. <laughs> I have more questions. Uh, do, you, do you have a mic near you? Mic here. Oh. Sounds well. Here, just uh, talk loud. Thanks. Yuri Janssens, a data scientist at Outbrain. My question is, I think, mostly for, uh, for Chris. Mm -hmm. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, different backgrounds for uh, data scientists, about education, uh, and it was really interesting to hear about uh, the Institute. So uh, I'm wondering, is there um, a place for data science in academia? Would we ever see uh, the job postings that Drew has, uh, has shown um, that, that one of the requirements was PhD in data science? Or do you think that a data scientist is bound to work for, on a specific domain in industry? Does that make sense? Um, okay, so the answer is yes. You will see PhDs in data science coming very soon. You will see PhDs in data science very soon. Uh, let me separate data science from data science. That is, you know, there's data science as a mindset and a skill set, and then the other thing is the phrase data science. So, you're going, to see, you're going to see PhDs in data science. You're going to see with those, that, those regular expressions on them very soon. 
separately from that is the brain set of, data, of the mindset of data science. And those people, I think, have been around for a long time. I mean, I'd, I'd like to say that I've been doing data science and the natural sciences for at least 10 years, right? Like trying to take natural science questions, reframe them as machine learning tasks, respect 50 years of bench work, and then produce a model that changes the dialogue in biology or in clinical work. Like, I, I think I've been doing data science in, the, in those fields. Um, so as far as whether or not there's a home for data science in the natural sciences, in the academia, yeah, I would say absolutely, even without the actual phrase data science behind it. And, and you know, like Bill Cleveland was writing about data science in 2001. Mark Hansen was writing about data science at UCLA, you know, in the, in the middle of the last decade. It's, it's, a design, it's a dialogue that's happened even under that moniker in academia for at least a decade. Um, but as far as whether that regular expression will be on somebody's PhD, absolutely. I, I predict be that. Be on somebody's master's first. Yeah, that's already here. Yeah. I mean, NYU is already accepting applications for a master's in, in data science, and I predict that they will be taking applications for a PhD very soon, and I predict that you know, they're not going to be the only one. I think there, there's a, a sort of follow-up to that question, which is, I mean, the way that statistics sometimes as a field interacts with the rest of academia is you know, sort of the handmaiden of the sciences. And I think that part of what, what prompted that, uh, that paper by Cleveland is that that vision had kind of fallen away that a lot of statisticians were spending time essentially purely on either problems that were mathematical stats or consulting outside. And that the, the I mean, you managed to, to pull it off as an applied mathematician in biology, but will there ever be like a, a, you know, within academia sort of data science consulting where someone's job is basically to, to help do the, the stats and, and the ML, um, not sort of as a covert plant like you are in, in bio? Do you think that'll ever come to pass, or will everybody continue to be under bio or physics or social sciences in order to, to pull it off? I don't see why not. I mean, applied mathematics. I mean, applied mathematics and statistics are both fields. You know, Tukey said, "Great part of being a statistician is you get to play in everybody else's backyard." I've certainly heard applied mathematicians say the same thing. I can remember when I was a postdoc, an anointed applied mathematician saying, "You know, a good applied mathematician should be able to publish in the best atmospheric journal, in the best geophysics journal, in the best everything." So. Yeah, there are departments like that where your job is to be useful in a broad set of disciplines. Next, uh, next question. Hi, I'm Dawn Barber. I co-founded New York Tech Meetup. I'm not a data scientist, but I highly respect what all you folks do. Um, I'm just curious what sort of maybe all of you, or particularly uh, Drew, uh, do you think, um, and, and what would you think it would look like to, um, to have a data scientist or um, a component of, of the city government, um, you know, sh would that be helpful? How would, you see, now. How would I mean, you see that looking? New York uh, City is actually very much the forefront of this, so right. I know Mike Flowers is a name that you should certainly Google. He's the, his title is the Chief Analytics Officer of New York City, and they've done Tremendous work um, in a really sort of well. So it's two things. I mean, Mike. So just to talk about Mike for a second, because I he's a person who I respect quite a lot, and he's done a tremendous amount of work for the city. Um, you know, he spent four years basically banging heads together on city hall and getting people in different departments to share data, um, and that was a, a lot of work. Um, which allowed his staff to actually do interesting things with the data. And now they're really starting to churn through lots of interesting stuff, and it's been you know, blessed by the man who built this building um, because he made all of his money off of data. So I think there's this nice convergence in New York City of having a mayor who actually cares deeply or at least understands the value of data um, and supporting Mike and his team and allowing them to do that. Now, that model, I think, is being exported to other cities, and Chicago is another good example where they have a chief data officer. And so, you know, these titles are, are what they are. They're just titles, but I think they represent a kind of change in attitude towards civic data. And it's two problems. One is a sort of open data movement, which I think has a lot of economic, you know, momentum behind it, and there's industrial offerings for doing these sorts of things. But more importantly is the attitude inside City Hall for actually producing interesting work. And Mike is a great example and really want to be held out for other cities to do that kind of work. Yeah, so Andrews is, Andrews, yeah, exactly. So he's the, yeah, so all, all, all those folks. I mean, everybody in that office is doing a tremendous amount of really interesting work. And I would, you know, the New York Times wrote an article about Mike in the Week in Review section a couple months ago. I would totally recommend reading it. Great. In, in the um, preceding this event, like in the sort of forum discussion, there was somebody that wanted to talk about favorite methods, statistical method, Mars, regression analysis, OLS, trees, CART, that type of thing. Is, is that person around or...? 
Any, anybody that you know is interested in having a more technical discussion should absolutely feel free. This is a okay. Uh, hold, hold on. So uh, which one? Just go ahead. So Just I a name and company and so ask whatever uh, question you want. For Claudia and Chris, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, information geometry, and if you have already, uh, like what do you think of its applications or its uh, future applications towards data science? And the second one is for Drew. Uh, so for a mathematician slash theoretical physicist uh, with a minor in business, what would you recommend uh, for uh, as as part of the social sciences, for me to study, like that's one personal Your question. Name and company. Your oh, sorry, my name is Carlos Medina, and um, I'm not currently with any company. I'm still looking uh, okay. for a job. But yeah, thank you. So um, I don't really know what information geometry is. Um, my general observation is sounds like a lot of direction of machine learning or some hating. And, um, so, so you mean you, you mean Amari's work from like 1988, like taking the Fisher taking the Fisher metric and treating it as a metric? Yeah. yeah, it, it's cool. It's a great entry point for a lot of people who are trained in differential geometry. It gets reinvented every couple of years by a theoretical physicist. Because once they've heard about the Fisher metric, then like if anybody says the word metric and you know how to deal with metrics, then you're like, oh well, let's think about a manifold with that metric. I haven't seen a lot of places where it was a big win, except for stochastic gradient descent, where you have to have gradient with respect to some parameters, and there's no natural sense of gradients. And so, and so information geometry turns out to set the metric to give a, a stochastic gradient descent method that works well. And you can see this in Dave Bly's papers. And I mean, it goes back to Robbins Monroe in 1951, but it turns out to be useful for, for defining a natural gradient. Other than that, it's just sort of a cool way of thinking about dependence on parameters. So it's data modeling and uh, creating models that uh, will actually work better than other models. So I, I don't really know because also it's just part of it is just the author trying to you know sell his idea. So I don't Amar really know Amari, the much. originator, or somebody more recent? Uh, I okay. So it was invented by a Japanese guy, Amari, yeah, yeah. several years ago. But it, no, gets, it, gets uh, it's re it gets rediscovered by theoretical physicists every couple of years. Wait, one, one, uh, one or two more. Uh, <laughs> if you want to pass, I got to answer. Yeah, question. Just, just briefly. I mean, I, I think. If you're interested in, in learning about the social sciences, I mean, you've already done a great thing, which is to admit you're interested in learning about the social sciences. <laughs> um, but after that, I would say, you know, think about what, what each of the disciplines kind of its fundamental thought processes. So, you know, like, I'm a political scientist, or political scientists at their core care about collective decision making or collective action. So, if that's interesting to you, you know, think about pursuing political science, read political science blogs, you know, as a start. If you care about, you know, markets and, you know, competitiveness, economists do that. If you care about risk appetites and behaviors, psychologists care about that. I would say like, if you have a, a question in mind or there's something that you're particularly interested in with respect to human behavior, then think about which of the disciplines is, the, is your sort of avenue in and look at that and go that way. Great. Oh, you'll get the last one. Go ahead, name and company. Victor, Victor Olex uh, slash DB. This is a, a funny question. What is the single most tedious, invisible kind of work that uh, you all hate doing and uh, it's a necessity in your job, but it's, uh, also kind of the biggest pain point that uh, you guys uh, have to deal with? Normal people would say data bunging, but the fact is I love shell script. So yeah. I have, yeah. I, have a, I have a dirty, like, <laughs> my, my power adapter says awk on it. Like, <laughs> my, like, the dirty secret is I just love writing shell scripts to munch data all the time. It's on my blog, actually. Oh, that's true. So Wait. normal people say, like, data munging, but the truth is I kind of like that stuff. Oh. I know, I know my pain point is um, uh, when you, like, it's very easy to write simple models, the, a lot of them, which a lot of times, you know, out of the box things work great. If you want to do more complicated kinds of modeling, you have to actually either find some incredibly buggy piece of software written by an academic, or if you're lucky, it's, it's something which is, you know, something that's really polished that's in our package, but more often you end up having to essentially um, rewrite things out of papers that were not, where they don't even explain enough of, of how to implement it. And um, I think those kind of things push me especially towards using the same models over and over again. And there are things I come across all the time that look fascinating that just, you know, they're, they're, 
you know, maybe someone's implemented it, but it's not in a, in a useful enough way. And then they're all in different formats, and so it's hard to make comparisons. And then, plus, I, then you have to hack and cross validation. And all these like, things you want to do with modeling that it's just easier to stick with the basics. And I think that's a pain point for me. So my, my main pain point is, so I did a proposal for the prototype, and it worked just fine. So you can see it in the performance all of good. I handed it off to the production team. They implemented it, and then it just doesn't perform. And then you're sitting there saying, well, what the, how the hell am I supposed to debug this? It just gives the wrong answers. I don't know what data you used to fit it. I have no idea whether you have a bug in the implementation. I don't know whether you got the parameters right. And I can't believe you're pulling it off. <laughs> I, know, I know what my biggest pain point is. My biggest pain point is, is trying to re-educate students who have read a bad paper, and because it was published, they think it's true. <laughs> I got one. Trying to explain error bars to people who don't want there to be any question about the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Some, like the hardest role you have as a data scientist, and this is when you get the, the label negative, is when you're saying, we actually don't know the answer to this, and you don't either, and no one knows the answer, and we can't pretend to know the answer. So they're like, so what's the, what's, what's the answer? Um, and you're like, well, this is our best estimate, but it's a shitty estimate, and the error bars are so big that it could actually be negative instead of positive, and it's not even allowed to be negative. So trust me, that's a bad estimate. And then they're going to go, they're like, okay, so it's that. And then they're going to, and you know they're going to just repeat it. Um, that's frustrating. I, I would sort of follow up on that and say, for me, my biggest pain point is plotting. Um, because the process of taking whatever you've done for a really long time and trying to explain that to someone else in a single picture. So plotting generally and then labeling plots because it's typically very hard to label a plot in a way that actually conveys the finding in a useful way um, without clouding it up or reducing it to nothing. Great. Last question, quick. Hi, uh, Tom Olds. I'm with Trellis Asset Management. Um, the question relates to, I wanted to get your various perspectives on the importance of feature selection or the relative importance of feature selection versus, you know, particular classifier selection and, and classifier parameterization. And, you know, have we got to a point with certain models, i.e. a support vector machine where feature, or feature selection doesn't matter anymore? Or kind of what's your perception on that? When you say feature selection, do you mean I have 100,000 features, but I only want parameters that are non-zero for some of them? When you say feature selection, do you mean feature creation? Like, I have to figure out the right way to represent this problem in features. Yeah, no, I mean, let's say, you know, because with big data, right, <laughs> there are 10,000, a million potential data items. Uh, are there kind of new, important, valuable algorithms that are allowing us to you know, choose from among those that set of but, features? Or what, do so, certain uh, classifiers no longer require you to be smart about that? I can answer that, and um, I think, first of all, it's always, um, you're always going to make more money by doing something hard than by doing something easy, okay? So that's just a general rule you learn in finance really quickly. Um, and you also never have enough data about the hard thing. That's what makes it hard. So the answer is that feature selection is always going to be very important. If you have something that's so easy to answer that you don't have to care about feature selection, you're not going to make any money doing it. Strongly disagree. Um, I think that there are... Uh, plenty of prediction problems where you don't want to know the features, where you have a, a full complexity model that's just some function of, the, of all the features, and I don't give it at all um, what the coefficients would be in any of them. I just want to know what's my accuracy, and I want to know how well I do. Sure. Um, but, uh, please, Claudia. So I go with that one. Um, I learned a lot about feature selection all my academic life, and then um, running into these data mining competitions that do ensembles that combine 100,000 models and have a one set of opinion on, on this and that and the other thing, um, you can actually get away without feature selection just fine. Um, today, we are building models in, I build models in you know, 10 million dimensions with, on a good day, 100,000 positives, on a bad day, 5,000, and good, it's not good enough to survive on Wall Street, but hey, for advertising. <laughs> It's not slow enough that <laughs> it, it's just fine. So it really depends like what level you need to get to, but I think modern algorithms today, you can get pretty far without trying to do feature selection. But you still need to have good features in the first place. Yeah. I mean, yeah it, it's, and I you, create more than I select. Yeah, and, and creating new features from data, I think, is still a lot of what this work ends up being. You know, it, just because you have a column doesn't mean that that column plus some other column is a feature. There may be some interesting things you can do with some processing or maybe ways that you can creatively uh, reduce some dimensionality of things. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that, that 
goes into creating smart features, especially from very heterogeneous data sets, that actually, once you have the features, any algorithm that's reasonable, you throw it at, I mean, will give you good results. Right. I think it also matters what your purpose is. I mean, your question is, do the techniques support doing this? Yes, they do. I mean, you can throw a bunch of data through a bunch of different algorithms and get a really, really good fit and not really care much about how the features were selected. But if you ultimately want to explain why, just while the algorithm is making that classification, then I think it matters greatly. And you know, my experience has been sort of think very parsimoniously about what you bring into your model because with each one of those, not only are you incurring a statistical penalty, you're incurring a sort of brain penalty and having to explain why the result is what it is when you get to whatever endpoint you're searching for. I mean, I think it's exactly it. It depends on, on your, your goal. If your goal is to do prediction, then it doesn't matter. And if your goal is to explain something that somebody can then say, like, now we use this as new information to advance the field some way, then absolutely it, it matters. I, I, I don't think it's just that question. I think it's also a question of what kind of thing you're trying to predict. So if you are trying to predict the, the, the market, you can't just create more data for that. There's only one close a day. You can look at tick data, but if you really care about daily closes, then you just can't just create more data sometimes. And that's why I would say parsimonious. But I do think in certain things, you can actually just collect more data. Or you can go find other data sets that would be useful. I mean, parallel. So. I mean, these people, you know, Bloomberg gives feeds for, for, you know, news information, and there's all kinds of ways of augmenting. That's a lot of what sort of quanti hedge funds do, right? Is they say, well, everyone only has, has the tick data or the close of day, but now let's find a thousand other new data sources to augment. Twitter. Twitter never <laughs> ends. It never ends. Okay, great. So our uh, speakers are going to be uh, around for the next part, so you guys can talk about uh, feature selection or sex on the first date with them. <laughs> and uh, please uh, give a hand. They've been awesome. First date, Thank first you day. very much. And now let's all go drink. <laughs>